And so I invite you now to uh, open your Bibles, first of all, to Psalm 37. Again, I'll read from two Testaments, briefly from the New. Our text is in Psalm 37, so we'll read just a portion of it up to uh, verse 13 this evening. Our text is verses 1 through 11. Then we'll jump over to Matthew 5 briefly to see how Jesus himself quotes part of this psalm in the Beatitudes. So let's read Psalm 37, just the first 13 verses. A psalm of David. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. <coughs> Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, and gnashes at him with his teeth. For the Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming." Just that far in the Old Testament. And then let us turn over if, brief, briefly to Matthew chapter 5 where we will find one of those Beatitudes from Psalm 37. Just beginning at verse 2, Jesus opened his mouth and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Just that far. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see just at the very outset in the reading of this psalm, Psalm 37, I invite you to turn your Bibles back there now, that in this, as the Holy Spirit inspired the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, to write this psalm that even now, all these centuries later, now in the 21st centuries, 21st century, these words ring true and speak to the times as well as, well as to our own hearts as God's people. As so apropos, 2015 certainly had its share of troubles, not only for us as a nation, or a state, or a county, or even a city. But perhaps in your own lifetime, in your own life, in your own family, perhaps 2015 had many troubles for you. At the same time, we can count the blessings of 2015 and enumerate them. And perhaps you did that at Thanksgiving time or Christmas time. And I would encourage you even this week to, as you meditate on this psalm, uh, and take home with you what you've been instructed in today and exhorted to, to, to today, that you will take home with you uh, a, a basket full of blessings, as it were, that the Lord has heaped upon you in 2015 and look forward not only with trepidation, some rightly so in terms of the chaotic state of the world in our country, but also with great anticipation in the blessings of the Lord and the care of the Lord as you wait upon Him and trust in Him again in 2016. And so as you look at the, as you look at the outline, I hope you were able to get a, a one in with you. You'll notice that we have four R's here in our 
sermon outline. I, again, this is not something I do very often, but this time I was able to. The psalmist, we, I think these first 13 verses, by the way, you'll notice that the psalm is very long. And uh, I just took off a little chunk this today, just, thir- just 11 verses. And in those first 11 verses, I think that the theme that comes out, stands out in those first 11 verses is waiting on and trusting in the Lord. And we can do so in four ways. First, by refusing to fret over the prosperity of non-Christians. Secondly, by remembering the remedies, namely the gracious promises and precepts in this psalm. Third, by resting and also submitting to providence. And fourthly, by rejoicing in grace's contrast in Christ. And we'll take those one at a time, those four R's. So the first one, as we come to this psalm and consider the exhortation that is here before us, the encouragement, the challenge, to wait on and trust in the Lord again in 2016, the first thing that the inspired psalmist lays out for us is that we can do so by refusing to fret. In particular, refusing to fret over the prosperity of non-Christians. As we come to this first verse and we read it again, do not fret because of evildoers. This is a timely exhortation because the, the Holy Spirit who inspires David, of course, knows that it is our nature to fret over evildoers. There is a lot of fretting going on in the United States, right? even as we speak over evildoers, especially by those who go by the name of ISIS at this particular time. But there's a lot of fretting in the Christian community over the, uh, the extreme uh, militant homosexual uh, lobby. But then the second, exer- the, the like, the, the, uh, the psalmist, so the psalmist challenges us right off the bat, do not fret because of evildoers. Temptation number one then, there are several listed here under this first point, and temptation number one is do not fret because of the evildoers. It is easy, it is an easy thing to do, and we need to be reminded not to do that. Now the psalm, I'm just going to say that much here because the psalm, is, as we unpack it, is going to have much to say about that very thing. So I'll leave it at that for now. Temptation number two is next, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. The second temptation here then that the Lord knows we are often succumb to, even as Christians, even as sometimes mature Christians, is to envy the apparent happiness and apparent easy life of non-Christians. The covenantal demand comes down to us, don't fret about that. Don't be envious about that. Calvin says this, Now all this depends upon the providence of God. For unless we are persuaded that our world is governed by Him in righteousness and truth, our minds will soon stagger and at length entirely fail us. You can see that the doctrine of the providence of God permeates this psalm. And it is a blessed thing to understand, have the grace of God in Christ to understand the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And it indeed comes as, uh, uh, to us as that which enables us, a tool that enables us to put off the temptation to fret because of evildoers and to put off the envy of the workers of iniquity. We would inst- indeed, our minds, our hearts, our souls would soon stagger and fail us were it not for an understanding of the providence of God that we have revealed to us in His Holy Word. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who purchased us, purchased us and redeemed us on the cross of Calvary, who now, now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and He there reigns and rules as King of Kings. We do not, as some Christians who are of a dispensational mindset, look think that someday Christ will begin His reign in some millennial kingdom. We confess that He is ruling and reigning right now and has been ever since He ascended 
into heaven. That he is governing and restraining the wicked. That he is restraining and governing evildoers. He is restraining and governing the workers of iniquity. And this is the, this is the hope that we have and that which enables us not to fret because of them or be envious of them. They are accountable to him. And that thought is going to be repeated again in verses 7 and 8. And that's a cause for rejoicing and comfort. That things are not willy-nilly spinning out of, wildly out of control. That Christ the King is ruling and reigning and governing. And part of that ruling and reigning is sometimes pulling his hand back somewhat and letting the wicked have their way for a season. But make no mistake, verse 2, they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Yes, they may, evildoers may seem to have the upper hand more often than not. The workers of iniquity may seem to prosper to such a degree that we become envious of them. But make, make no mistake, they will be cut down. They will wither. And these words are designed to help you as a subject of the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, to see non-Christians through His eyes. To see the wicked, the evildoers, the workers of iniquity through the eyes of the King. Do non-Christians prosper today? Seemingly so. Don't fret, says the Word of God. Don't envy them. They will be mowed down like grass very soon. We have now just beginning to see those brown hillsides starting to show some signs of life and turning a little green. And we anticipate that in spring, in, in spring that the, the uh, hills will be green again. And we know that later on, weeks later, they will, the grass will again die and turn brown in the summer. And so it is with the wicked. They, they flourish for a time like the grass. But they shall be mowed down. And who shall cut them down? Who shall do the mowing? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And we confess in the Apostles' Creed, He shall come to judge the living and the dead. And so knowing this, Christian, just these two verses, knowing this, why fret? over non-Christians. Why fret or envy non-Christians? And so the first thing we have seen then is that waiting on trusting in the Lord, we can wait on and trust in the Lord in 2016 by refusing to fret over the prosperity of non-Christians. That's the first thing. That's the first R, refusing to fret. The second R is remembering. By remembering the remedies that are provided. Namely, gracious promises and precepts. Verse 3, we see the first remedy that is given to us. That we are called to remember. Namely, trust in the Lord. Look at the verbs. Trust, do good, dwell, feed. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Yes, we see wicked non-Christians becoming richer and perhaps more powerful, more influential, more sinful to be sure. What is the remedy the psalmist prescribes, the Holy Spirit prescribes through him? Trust in Yahweh. Trust in your covenant keeping God. As the Catech Heidelberg Catechism says, withdraw your trust from all creatures and place it alone in Him. The result of trusting Christ completely and submitting to His rule, devotion to doing what Christ says is good, namely, loving God and loving neighbor. The result of trusting Christ completely and doing good, submitting to His rule, is remembering that Christ as our chief prophet is leading us to the promised land, that this world is not my, our home, that we are heading to, we are on a pilgrimage, we are on a journey, we are here only for a short time, a few decades, and then we're heading to Jerusalem the golden, the land with milk and honey blessed. So while you're here in your pilgrimage, the exhortation from the Holy Spirit in the psalm is 
dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And even as we came to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table this morning, Christ our shepherd continuously prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Psalm 23. He feeds us as our Heidelberg Catechism says, His crucified body and shed blood are the true meat and drink of our souls unto life eternal. And we've experienced that again today. Have you been, are you tempted to react sinfully to God's providence? The remedy, brothers, sis, brothers and sisters, here in the psalm is relax and feed on the steadfast, steadfastness and faithfulness of Christ, your King and your Shepherd. Feed on the faithfulness and steadfastness of Christ like a contented sheep in a green pasture. That's the first remedy in the second, on the second point. The second remedy is in verse 4. We say that there are remedies here in these per verses. The second remedy, delight yourself also in the Lord. That's a little bit different than trust, isn't it? Delight, and what is the promise? That's the command. Delight yourself in the Lord, the promise attached, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Is the wickedness of the wicked getting under your skin? Understandably so. This, on the one hand, the great contrast set before us here is a picture of the spiritual delight of Christ's sheep as compared with the empty, fleeting joys of prosperous non-Christians. And the call to action, the, the exhortation here, is to meditate on what He has done for you through His Son. Election, calling, regeneration, justification, adoption, faith, just to mention a few. Recall how He has and He is transforming you week by week, year by year by the power of His Holy Spirit. Count the blessings that the Father has poured out over you, on you over the years. The spiritual blessings, the physical blessings, the intellectual blessings, the emotional blessings, the relational blessings that He has given you over the years. And then look forward by faith to what Christ will do for you in the years and the centuries and the millennia to come. Delight yourself also in the Lord in all those ways and more. And the promise to you who delight yourself in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, He shall give you the desires of the heart. Now we all know that our name it and claim it, brothers and sisters, run away with verses like this and say and as if we have here a blank check or a limitless platinum MasterCard. That certainly is not the intent of the psalmist. Nothing like that is promised in the Scripture. There's no promise here that if we delight in the Lord, then He will give us every physical thing that we can possibly imagine. And in fact, I would go so far as to say, God forbid that He would give us everything we want. Can you imagine what your life would be like if, if, the, if your Heavenly Father did give you every single thing that you've ever wanted? Imagine that for a little while. It is a blessing that the Lord does not give us everything we want and so but in our sanctification Christ's de desire for us as his people as his sheep is that more and more the desire of our hearts would become the desire of his heart that or to put it another way the more you find yourself delighting in the Lord the more your desires and your petitions your prayers will perfectly align with his best for you Think of a child in, in its childhood, or perhaps this is even true of you, it's true of most children. On the one hand, resisting the father's uh, perhaps biblical wishes for that child. And then as that child grows and perhaps begins to approach middle age, more and more that child wants those things that the godly father wished for him or her. So it is with the sanctified Christian. The more your desires, the more you'd find yourself delighting in the Lord year after year, decade after decade, by God's grace at work in you, in Christ, 
the more your desires and your petitions will perfectly align with his best for you and he will give you the desires of your heart. So go to your loving Heavenly Father in prayer daily in 2016. Lay out your desires and your petitions before Him and come away confident that He will act in ways that are best for you in 2016. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically, in every way. That's the second remedy that's laid out for us in these verses in this second part. The third remedy is to use the language of the Hebrew, rolling your burdens onto the Lord, verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. That word commit there in the New King James is, in the Hebrew is very picturesque uh, language. It's as if you took the burden, the heavy let's say 125 pound backpack that was on your back and you rolled it off of you in your straining to do so and onto the back of an Olympic weightlifter who could perhaps military press 500 pounds or so. That's the picture here. Rolling your burden onto the strong shoulders of another. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll your burden onto the Lord. Leaving our lives in the hands of Christ our shepherd. That's what we're commanded to do here. Patiently waiting and trusting in our Father for whatever He knows is best for us each and every day, the next 365. And there's a promise attached. Once again, you see this back and forth. Command, promise. Command, promise. To put it another way, covenantal demands... And obligations, covenantal promises. What's the promise attached? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and the promise. And He shall bring it to pass. He alone is worthy of our absolute uncompromising trust. The burden of orchestrating our own lives again in 2016 is too heavy to bear without this hearty trust in Christ. But the promise is that He, those as you are have, uh, experiencing and engaging in that hearty trust in Christ, that He will bring His perfect will for you to pass again this year. In fact, verse 6 goes on to say more about that. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Now we have language. The scene shifts from a, from a pasture where, uh, where we are feeding on His faithfulness. Shifts from the imagery of taking a heavy burden and, burden and putting it on the shoulders of a, a great strong man. Now to the courtroom. The imagery of a courtroom. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Because it is the fact that Christ's sheep are often misjudged. That Christ's sheep are often abused. Christians are often abused by non-Christians. As if we were cr criminals. Increasingly more and more in our California culture. Injustice toward Christians here is painted as a dark night. But Christ's righteousness has become yours by grace through faith in Him. And He has robed you in His light. And when He comes to judge the living and the dead, He will bring forth the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. So, as you wait on, tr wait on and trust in the Lord in 2016, refuse to fret over the prosperity of non-Christians by the grace of God and remember the remedies provided through these gracious promises and precepts. That's the first two things. And the third thing is, wait on and trust in the Lord by resting and also submitting to His providence. Resting in Yahweh and patiently waiting for Him. Perhaps that's one of the hardest words in the Bible. Wait. We are a people 
it is human nature to resist the idea of waiting. Perhaps you experienced this with your children or grandchildren as the days got shorter, uh, as the time between uh, December 1st and December 25th transpired. It's hard to wait. But here we are exhorted to rest in the Lord, literally to be still toward Jehovah. The idea there, the language there in the original of, of waiting on the Lord denotes resignation, a quiet of mind which rests on God, renouncing all self-help and submitting to the will of God, says one lexicon, Hebrew lexicon. Wait patiently for Him, the Scripture says. And that Hebrew word patiently there in one lexicon is described this way. The inward gathering of oneself together in hope, intently directed towards God. Do not, the exhortation comes to us again this year, don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Yes, the wicked may and probably will in 2016 prosper in the short term, but they will indeed pay the price as they go through life. And in the end, they will pay the ultimate price. And it's important for us to remember and have God's perspective on the wicked. Christ wants us to resist our temptation as we go through life. And He lays out some very difficult providences for us. He wants us to to resist our tendency to vent our frustrations in loud anger. On the contrary, he says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. It's very easy to get anger, angry, isn't it, over the happenings of the times in our state or in our nation. But Christ here calls us and wants us to quietly submit to and quietly wait for His will for us. So the question comes to you and me in 2016. Will you quietly wait on the Lord as you conduct your affairs in a Christ-honoring way in 2016, relying on His grace to do so? Resting and submitting to God's providence involves waiting patiently for Him. And that is often a very difficult thing to do. In fact, I would go further and say it's impossible without His help, the help of the Holy Spirit. But the other is even perhaps just as difficult, refusing to be angry with Him for the wicked schemes of non-Christians. Non-Christians often challenge Christians and say, if God is sovereign as you say, if He is omnipotent, if He is all-powerful, then why doesn't He just destroy all the evil in the wor world? And sometimes Christians themselves, even Reformed and Presbyterian Christians, fall into a, a state of mind when we are angry with our Heavenly Father, angry with our God, for not taking action against the wicked schemes of Christians. Why does the Lord allow the, the radical homosexual activists to, to promote their, uh, their lifestyle without any, seemingly con any seeming consequences? Why does He allow our shores to be invaded by members of ISIS? We sometimes ask in our anger, but the command comes down, cease from anger, forsake wrath. And a reason attached, do not fret, it only causes harm. And so the Holy Spirit reminds us through David how quickly we can lose it, even as Reformed Christians. How easy it is for us to become angry with our Father for His providence. And here we have an admonition, Christ Himself calling us in His Word to cease from anger and to forsake wrath, to stop fretting, because those sins only cause harm. Those, sin, that, that, those sins often involve pushing Christ away. 
and injuring on the horizontal level, injuring those he calls us to love. That's the third thing. Wait on and trust in the Lord by resting and submitting to his providence in 2016. The fourth thing. Waiting on and trusting in the Lord by rejoicing in Christ, in grace's contrast in Christ. That may be somewhat of a cryptic kind of a point at first, but you'll see the sense of the language in a moment. Wait on and trust in the Lord in 2016 by resting and also submitting to providence this year. Firstly, in verses 9 and 10, we are again confronted with the wicked and we are reminded again that their prosperity, though it may be great, is temporary and short-lived. Evildoers, verse 9, shall be cut off. And so, the Christian, let your meditation on their fate, on their fate, fate quench your anger. A little while, verse 10, and the wicked shall be no more. Whereas we confess that we believe in the life everlasting, the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, the verse goes on, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But someone says, Pastor, I don't see it. Non-Christians prosper abundantly in their sinful pleasures. Meanwhile, Christ's sheep endure great persecution and afflictions and in many parts of the world great poverty, chastening by the hand of the Lord. But waiting on the Lord, beloved, includes waiting a while until He judges non-Christians in His way and in His time with confidence that he will do so because he says he will. He will judge the wicked, the non-Christians, for their rebellion against him in his time and in his way. Their time will come. You can count on it. And secondly, the return, not only will he come to judge the living and the dead, the return of Christ is getting near. Every generation, every decade, Even every year, the judge is at the door. And so as we remember this contrast between the grace of God to His people and all that that means, and the the short-lived, though perhaps splendid, apparently, prosperity of the wicked, we are secondly reminded of the inheritance of those who meekly wait on Yahweh, namely, the entire planet, the earth, the land. For those, those who wait on the Lord, verse 9, they shall inherit the earth. Waiting for the perfect timing of the Lord, Jesus Christ is a challenge for every Christian, even pastors. Waiting for His deliverance instead of taking matters into our own hands is a difficult thing for us because of our remaining sinful nature with which we have to struggle our whole life long. It's extremely difficult, especially for those with type A personalities. The Calvin reminds us of our own weakness here. The flesh, he says, is always seeking to build its nest forever here. And were we not tossed hither and thither, and not suffered to rest, we would by and by forget heaven and the everlasting inheritance. That's an interesting way of saying there is a reason why sometimes the providence of God is so severe to make us remember that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Because of the cross of Christ, you, brothers and sisters, belong to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And He protects you by His power. And your security in your pilgrimage on this earth is far superior to any temporary blessings that so-called and prosperity that non-Christians might enjoy. You who are living by faith in Christ, walking by faith, not by sight, will be rewarded in this life and that which is to come. 
So the psalmist says, Yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. You will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth. Now we live as meek sheep among savage wolves. And some, from time to time, those savage wolves has the, have their way with Christ's people. Again, as part of God's providence. But soon, only God knows how soon, humble Christians like you will inherit forever the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Timothy reminds us that bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. We don't have much information in the scriptures about what it means to inherit the earth. But what we do know is that because you belong to Christ, this is true. 1 Corinthians 3.21, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. That's what God says. That's getting his perspective on the situation. As we remember this great contrast of grace in Christ as compared to graceless humanity without Christ, we've seen that the prosperity of non-Christians over and over in the psalm, we've seen that the prosperity of non-Christians is short-lived and that the inheritance of those who meekly wait on the Lord is the earth itself. And not even this fallen earth, this fallen earth temporarily, but the renewed heavens and earth eventually. And then the third thing we see here in verse 11 is that there is not only that, the promise of the inheritance of the earth, but also the promise of delightful and abundant peace in verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of of peace. Perhaps it's true that many humble Christians have not been blessed with an abundance of material wealth and goods. But brothers and sisters, whether you are rich or poor, upper, middle, lower class, you have so something far more valuable than this world's goods. In 2016 again, you are promised abundance of peace. Isaiah says it this way by inspiration, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Why? Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Matthew Henry reminds us that inward peace and tranquility of mind, peace with God is what is promised here and then peace in God through Christ. Jesus said, said it this way, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so, brothers and sisters, this exhortation comes to us at the beginning of a new year, wait on and trust in the Lord in 2016 by refusing to fret over the prosperity of non-Christians. By remembering the remedies provided through the gracious promises and precepts, not only here, but throughout God's Word. By resting in the Lord. By submitting to His providence. Not with clenched teeth, but joyfully as to a loving Father. Knowing that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And finally, by rejoicing in this great contrast of grace in Christ as compared to the apparent and short-lived prosperity of the wicked. May God grant you the grace to do so more and more in the coming months. Amen.